From Yahoo Finance, this is Ballots and Dollars, a podcast about the politics that affect your pocketbook. I'm Rick Newman. And I'm Alexis Christophorus. Today, we are talking about the wealth tax. What is it? And does it directly help those who need it the most? And Rick, there's been a lot of talk, especially among some Democratic presidential hopefuls, Elizabeth Warren, uh, to name one, uh, who is very much in favor of, of the wealth tax. But tell me, would this affect not just the top 1% of earners, it would affect much less than that, right? Well, it depends where you set the where, where you set the threshold. So what Elizabeth Warren wants to do, she's the main proponent of this idea, but there are some economists who have been studying it for a while, and there are a few countries that have, that have a wealth tax, and there are others that used to have a wealth tax and no longer do have a wealth tax because of some of the problems with it. What Elizabeth Warren wants to do, she, ha- she has a plan for everything, as we know, mm-hmm. and uh, her plans uh, will require new funding, uh, so she has a plan for uh, free college for a lot of students, not for everybody, but for for many students. She has she supports the Green New Deal environmentally, other things like she favors universal uh, pre-K um, for kids. So where's the money going to come from? Wealth This wealth tax uh, that she has um, proposed. So the way it would work uh, in her plan is uh, up to, uh, you, there's no additional tax up to $50 million. So I think you and that I takes are safe. Yeah, you and phew, I are safe. We just made it, Rick. <laughs> but once you hit uh, $50 million in wealth, this is not income, but in wealth. Mm-hmm. Um, you would pay a 2% tax on all of your wealth above $50 million. And if you have wealth in the billions, well, you would pay the 2% from 50 million to 1 billion, and then above 1 billion, you would pay 3%. Um, And uh, based on uh, all the wealthy people out there who would get hit with this tax, uh, she and her planners say this would raise around $275 billion a year. That's a lot of money. That's a so lot as, of money. Okay, as let's, taxes go, this one would bring in a lot of money. Yeah, let's break this down. So when, when we talk about overall, you're saying it's not just your income. It's your overall sort of household take, if you will. So this right. is this includes things like artwork. Yes, it does. Right. They, but but one of the problems with this is it's and, – and you make note of this. You actually wrote an article about this not long ago. You, I, I like the way you refer to it as squishy. And it is mm-hmm. squishy because wealth is not a perfect science. So isn't the first challenge to a wealth tax just really determining what someone's wealth is? Yes. Yeah. So in the way, the way that I think about this um, is if I were to ask you what's your income – you don't need to tell me on air. Thank I'm not you. asking you to tell me, <laughs> but you know what you pretty much know what your income is. You have a number in your mind. It right. might be whatever the number was on your last tax return. If I ask you what your wealth is, you probably don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Does that include um, stock holdings? I mean, Which I change? own part of a house. Mm-hmm. Um, what is my house worth? Um, I mean, you can look up on Zillow, I guess, and say, here's what Zillow thinks it's worth, what percentage of that is mine, and what percentage is the bank's, and so forth. But these are fluid um, things. And that's a, that's a simple example. Um, wealthy people have very complicated assets. Um, a lot of <clears throat> uh, wealthy people have their, uh, their, um, their main asset is a business. Um, and a lot of times these are private, privately owned businesses. Um, how do you eat, know what a business is worth um, when there's no stock? Um, you, you know, you don't. There's no trading in the shares of the company, and you don't. Nor, you know, if you're running a family business, uh, you, you don't normally like have somebody. Uh, assess the value of your business on a regular basis. I mean, that's what investment bankers do during Mm -hmm. um, IPOs. You're not going to be paying to do that. You know what your revenue is. um, You know um, what your net income is, your profit. You know what your taxes are. But you don't know what the value of the business is. So there are many problems with the idea of a wealth tax. um, And this is one of the big ones, which is how do you establish uh, what people's wealth actually is? Um, some people have real estate that has not uh, been on the market in years or decades. Uh, there are some families uh, uh, France used to have a I guess France still does have a wealth tax, although they've changed uh, part of their taxation system so that uh, they're they're getting less money from from a wealth tax these days. But they've had a situation where farmers um, have a valuable land that goes back centuries. Uh, and makes them wealthy right. according to the way the system assesses their wealth, but they don't have the income to pay the wealth tax um, because they they just don't make that much money. So um, this is one of the problems. Um, I think the the reason – part of the reasoning um, behind Elizabeth Warren's thinking and other people on this 
And there's a new paper I'm drawing from by uh, two economists who are actually advising Elizabeth Warren. Uh, these two guys have done a lot of work on a lot of good work on uh, income inequality and things like that. <clears throat> Emmanuel Saez and Gabriel Zuckman, both at UCAL Berkeley. Uh, I could be mispronouncing those names, but um, you gave it a good um, try. The idea here is that we have worsening income inequality in the United States. I mean, this has been a trend that has been going on for a long time. We we know this. This is not news, uh, but it just does keep getting worse. So we have the richest. Uh, increasingly control more and more of the nation's wealth. And it's a tricky problem because um, no one knows exactly what is the optimal level of income inequality. You need some income inequality mm -hmm. um, or else if, if everybody's going to earn the same, somehow nobody has motivation to go out and start a company or take any risk. If you, you know, the ability to get rich is a powerful motivator for a lot of people to start Absolutely. companies and innovate and for Jeff Bezos to figure out um, how Amazon is going to break the mold in retail and stuff like that. Um, but at a point, you end up with too much and you, uh, you know, <clears throat> you, get, you, you get stuck in a situation where the middle class stagnates. Um, middle class living standards just don't seem to be getting ahead. Uh, that can lead to uh, political anomalies such as Donald Trump getting elected um, or other things. I mean, in, you know, in radical situations, it can lead to riots uh, and revolutions. I don't think that's hap going to happen in the United States anytime soon. But one of the – so the question is what can you do about income, income inequality? And one, one of the things you can do about it is just tax wealthy people more. Um, but, so but that they have less. But if you look at history, that doesn't always work. And in some places, it just it just flat out failed. There are some European countries that right. tried this and had to retract it. Yeah. So one of the reasons this has failed in Europe uh, and one of the uh, data points in this paper that these two economists recently put out, which is on the Brookings Institution's website, and I always tell people, don't take my word for it. Go find the research. You can look it up yourself. Yeah, it's pretty comprehensive with uh, charts and all that. It's called Progressive Wealth Taxation by Saez, S-A-E-Z, and Zuckman, Z-U-C-M-A-N, at the Brookings, Brookings Institution website. Um, uh, is evasion of the tax. I mean, every time mm, there's a tax, offshore sure. Um, so effect. every time there's a new tax, um, there are efforts to evade the tax, whether legally or illegally. Um, and of course, people who are wealthy can generally afford, um, you know, the experts who know how to do that. So this is one of the problems they've had in Europe: is um, people just moving their money to someplace where it can't be found, and you can do that legally. Um, using legal tax havens, and I'm no, I'm far from an expert on this, but Liechtenstein has certain types of tax havens, um, or you can do it illegally, which is I think what we saw when those, if you remember the Panama Papers um, controversy, which showed uh, a lot of wealthy people from all over the world were using this, I think, a law firm in Panama to just basically hide money so they wouldn't have to pay taxes on it in their home countries. So there's a um, there's an enforcement problem. Uh, there's also an, uh, this problem here in the United States that it might not be constitutional to impose a wealth tax. And that's because uh, the Constitution says that um, anytime you have a direct tax on consumers, it has to be apportioned in such and such a way. Um, and the net effect of that means that um, – you could, it, it's a real anomaly with the way that this would this would actually have to be imposed um, it, it, that would leave less wealthy people uh, or wealthy people in states that are overall less wealthy mm -hmm. based on average incomes in that state paying more in taxes than people with the same wealth in wealthier states. Sure, it's a, it's a, it's a very it's a real oddity. Now Congress could change the law. Right. Um, but while we're talking about Congress changing the law to impose something like this, it raises the whole, uh, you know, likelihood or unlikelihood of Congress ever doing anything to pass this kind of tax. Uh, so, I don't think a, a wealth tax is going to happen anytime soon. But um, it's um, it, I can definitely see this having populist appeal. Right, and is this something that an Elizabeth Warren could actually win on? It's, this platform. It's that's a. I mean, that's the question. Right. Um, it's a good question. Um, she is rising in the polls, and while she while she's not ahead of Joe Biden yet, the thing that is very interesting to me is that if you combine people who favor both 
Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders together, Mm -hmm. um, that does, in most polls, add up to more people than support Joe Biden. So let's say one of them were to drop out. It's it's logical that the people who since Biden and uh, sorry, since Sanders, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are very similar um, kind of to the far left of the Democratic Party and the progressive policies, some would say socialist policies. Um, So if one of them drops out, the other could get all those supporters and suddenly be ahead of Joe Biden. So um, and it's even possible that let's say Bernie Sanders uh, sees the writing on the wall at some point and says, I'm throwing all my support to Elizabeth Warren. Um, that that would you know have be, have to be kind of a selfless thing. I'm not <laughs> sure any politician, even them, I'm not sure they're selfless enough to say, you know, if I'm going to take one for the team and I'm just going to throw my support to the other person. And if anybody did that, it would probably be Sanders uh, going in support of Warren rather than the other way around. Right. But Elizabeth Warren is really fired up. Um, she's she's got the big mo. She's got momentum. Um, people like her, and she's just younger than Bernie Sanders. I think she's 69 as we sit here, and Bernie's in his. Uh, I don't know. You know how Bernie, old Bernie Sanders no, is? No, but I would. 70s. Guess, I would guess late 70s. His, yeah, I think he's got a close to a decade on Elizabeth Warren. Yeah. No. And honestly, she seems fresher, and um, you know, she does have some new ideas. And Bernie Sanders has kind of run on the same thing he ran on four years ago. Um, so she's a more interesting candidate. So all right. So there's this promise of a wealth tax. You think it's far flung to think it would actually pass in in Congress. Uh, you do have AOC, I, I, Alexandria well, uh, well, Ocasio-Cortez. Let, I mean, let's let's say looking for one. Let's say um, if a if a Democrat wins the White House, um, there's a reasonable. I mean, it's reasonable to assume that Democrats will uh, hold the House mm-hmm. of Representatives, yes. especially if a Democrat wins the White House. And it's plausible that Democrats could take the Senate if. A Democrat wins a White House. So, in other words, if you have a surge of voters all going Democrat and they just go down the ballot Democrat, so if you if you end up with a Democratic Congress, which would net which would not have uh, more than um, sixty votes, so it would not it would still have to deal with the filibuster in the Senate. But could they, on a majority basis, pass something like this? I still think it would be tough. But um, I don't know. I think you well, know. She's I promising, think they, like you said at the top of the podcast, two point seventy five trillion dollars over the next decade. If a wealth tax, two point seventy five. Like that's right. If, if this wealth tax that she's proposing were to actually happen, but I guess at the end of the day, what does that mean for the average person, for the poor people who this wealth tax is really supposed to benefit? Are they going to see any of that two point seventy five trillion dollars? That's that's a great question. So, what do you do with the money, and do you do something productive with the money, or do you do something wasteful with the money? I think is is the is the question. Well, it worries me the minute we give any sort of found money, if you will, to lawmakers. Right. Yeah, that, that's the most valid point. Um, and I think that another. Um, so, I mean, I guess it, I guess the answer depends on do you believe that Elizabeth Warren wants to spend money the right or way? Or does there need is, to be stipulations on whatever money is raised from the wealth tax so that, you know, they can't just jump in there, filibuster a law and say, oh, we need money for this, that and the other thing. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think the, the way this tends to happen in Washington is you start out that way. Mm. So we're going to enact this new program and we're going to come up with this funding source over here to pay for it. Um, but then over time. Uh, loopholes get written in, major- majorities change, one, a new party comes into power and weakens what the old party did and so forth. So th- that's just the way government works. So yes, it's plausible that you end up with uh, this new tax that kind of knocks down the super rich um, but doesn't accomplish that much right. for everybody else. On the other hand, um, you know, there's good evidence that universal pre-K, for example, really pays benefits. I mean, you give kids uh, a boost early in life that they seem to retain, so they do better all throughout school. And um, also, let's not forget it allows parents who need to work yeah, that early on right. in their child's yeah. life to be able Thank to do you, so. Thank you, working mom. And how I <laughs> I know from what I speak. Yeah. And you know, you're able to to get out there and, and earn a little yeah. while. You don't have to worry about paying for your child's schooling. Yep. Uh, another thing that Elizabeth Warren wants to do, you know, I've talked about this is um, free college. Now, she's not as generous as Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is free college for everybody, not free. It's paid for by some new tax. Mm -hmm. Um, But Elizabeth Warren wants uh, something similar, just not quite as uh, grandiose, um, which includes debt forgiveness. So, uh, And this Elizabeth Warren's plan would be based on family income, I believe. So um, you get total debt forgiveness below a certain threshold of family income, and you qualify for uh, free 
uh, tuition at, pu- at a public university um, and then you get less of a benefit um, the higher up the income chain you go. So that's another thing she would spend the money on. Um, you know, education provides good returns, but it, these things all need to be done right. And if you're just um, – if what you're doing is creating an incentive for kids – to study things they wouldn't otherwise study, for mm-hmm, example, or mm-hmm. things they don't have a natural interest or proclivity for, um, and maybe they're, you're not getting a good return on the money. I mean, it just, again, depends how, how you spend it. But the, um, the, the sort of conceptual problem I, I have with the wealth tax is that um, it's the, the worsening income inequality that we have is very – it's very clear. It's very well documented. There's a lot of good work on that. But you're not necessarily helping the people at the bottom in the middle by knocking down the people at the top. Mm-hmm. So just because you take – from you make somebody else worse off does not automatically mean you're making somebody else better off. Um, and there's it, – it, it's just not as easy as we need to take money from the – you know, American aristocracy, if you will, which is kind of like the inheritor class. Um, I mean, it might actually be a good thing to, you know, put new limits on inheritances and things like that. I mean, people, you know, we do Would have- Would that be a practical way have, to, to, to deal with it? I mean, maybe it's not called a wealth tax. Well, there's this other way of doing it, which is called an income tax. I mean, <laughs> so- That is true. So one of the things you- a legitimate question for Elizabeth Warren, and she should come on this show and give us answers to some of these questions. We'd love to hear from is, Elizabeth. Is um, what's wrong with just increasing the income tax? I mean, you don't, you don't. Ha- there are no questions of constitutionality because U.S. law already. Well, because then it's based on your income, income and your income only, Rick. Not you know, do I have the Rembrandt hanging up in my living yeah. room? Yeah, and I guess that's part of the answer. Um, but you can also make the point that overall taxation on incomes is. Um, just a lot lower than it has been in the past. And mm-hmm. it's, and that's true at the top as well. And you could also raise the capital gains tax rate um, so that, you know, for people who don't have labor income the way you and I do, uh, I see you at work every day, so I know you have labor you income. You see me laboring. Um, you know, a lot for many, for many people, um, the tax rate on capital gains is a lot lower than it is on labor income. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you this, – this, this is how we have sort of gotten this self-perpetuating American aristocracy is um, once you've got the wealth, um, as long as you can protect the wealth, you can take gains on the wealth at a tax rate that's lower than what you, what you would pay if you went to a job. So um, we could just raise those taxes as well and those taxes are already on the books. It's just a question of what the rate is. Um, so you could do that as well. Um, but wh- how do you – Again, how do you then turn around and raise up the people you're trying to raise up? I mean, the right. sort that's, of the, the that's core what it's all about at the end of the day. Is not that one group one group is making too much money, it's that another group is not making enough money and it's and they're not the same thing. I mean, in capitalism, um, there's not a fixed pie, pie of wealth and we don't have to fight over uh, uh, you know, one pie because the pie always grows. I mean, there we can create wealth in capitalism. It's one of the greatest things about capitalism is you can create wealth. It happens all the time. We need more wealth creation among lower and middle income people. So they're not lower and middle income people anymore. And that's where we're stuck. Um, that's where we have, you know, the, the education system is failing, especially inner city education systems. Um, people are not learning the skills for a digital economy. Um, they're not going to college, ready for college. I mean, just the basics, you know. Um, so but doesn't just, taxing the uber wealthy, the 001 percent, if you will, stifle innovation, innovation that could actually help lift the lower income folks because it could give them opportunities, job opportunities? Yeah, that is one of the several dings on the wealth tax is that um, if you're going to tax people's wealth, they're going to have less motivation to um, acquire that wealth and we may we wouldn't even get an Amazon. Right. Um, um, I, I, I think it depends, you know, with taxation, you have to have some taxation. And um, the question is always what's the optimal level of taxation where you, you maintain the best set of incentives um, – but you bring in the revenue that we need. And we are, not, we are not at the optimal level of taxation right now. And the way you know that is that we have annual deficits of right. almost a trillion dollars. So on an, on an annual basis, the U.S. government spends almost a trillion dollars more than it takes in. So something's wrong there. And the one conservative point of view is, oh, well, the government spends too much. But it's the, gov- the Republicans who have approved those spending levels. So 
um, so, something needs to give here at some point, and the wealth tax is just one way of thinking about it. So I want to, I do, I do want to talk about the effect this might have on real people. So the two economists I've been talking about who did this uh, study, Emmanuel Saez and Gabriel Zuckman, both of UCAL Berkeley, uh, they applied this model um, for a wealth tax to uh, the top 15 wealthiest people in the Forbes five, uh, 400 list and said what would happen to their wealth if, um, if this had been in place going all the way back to 1982. So uh, let's see. Um, These are individuals? So if – yeah. Okay. Jeff Bezos. So he's number one. He's the richest guy. Um, now, this there are some hypotheticals here because Jeff Bezos wasn't the richest guy in the world in, in 1982. 1982. But they, right. they, okay. accounted, they accounted for that. So uh, Bezos' uh, net worth right now estimated at $160 billion. That's a, a phenomenal amount of money. But if, the, if a wealth tax similar to Elizabeth Warren's plan had been in place since 1982 – Jeff Bezos' net worth would not be $160 billion. It would only be $87 billion. Okay. Well, I mean, would that, would, that change, <laughs> would that change Jeff Bezos' incentive? Right. I mean, I so think about it. It's still a heck of a lot of money, uh, but let's it basically do Warren, let's slashed do Warren, in half. Yeah. So let's overall. do Warren Buffett. So um, now Warren Buffett takes a bigger hit. And the reason is he was he was around all the way back. He's been around all the way since back to 1982. So if you backcast this thing, you know, this is really just a thought exercise. Mm-hmm. But uh, Warren, if if he had been subject to the wealth tax going back to 1982, his wealth would not be 88 billion dollars, which it is now. It would only be 30 billion dollars. Okay. Uh, so I mean, like, does, still that, does, that, does, that, does that matter? Mark Zuckerberg. Um, Currently, $61 billion. If uh, he had been subject to a wealth tax for all the time he's been a billionaire, he wouldn't have $61 billion. He'd only have $44 billion. Hmm. I mean, I guess if you really want to play devil's advocate. So all of these people have foundations and they're big philanthropists. Mm -hmm. Do these charities, which do then, uh, you know, go and help poorer people, would they be getting less from the uber wealthy? And if enough people give less, what's the the, the, uh, outcome in the aggregate? All unknowables, um, but um, yeah, these are the kinds yeah. of effects you, you'd have to uh, wonder about. You know, this also gets the question. I mean, it would be fun to do this ex- exercise where you say, "Let's apply the wealth tax to," uh, I'm, which I'm sure they did it for 15, so they could probably do it for the rest of the 400. Um, let's apply it to everybody on there, and you might get to some level where someone's where some not a poor, billionaire some anymore. Some poor bastard, <laughs> you know, he's no longer worth three billion dollars. Right. He's only worth a hundred million or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then they did another exercise where, I mean, you could set the wealth tax higher than that. Um, and But if you do that, then because this is an annual tax, by the way, right. um, if you set it too high, you erode people's – you erode this base of wealth so much that there's nothing left to tax after right. – after, well, We don't want to do that. At, some at least I hope time. Elizabeth Warren and doesn't want to do that. And you've probably gone too far at that point. But yeah. again, it gets to this ba- basic question, what is the optimal level of taxation? I think the best chance – for something like Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax would be if we had a recession or if we had, you know, if we do end up with some kind of fiscal crisis, which the, uh, you know, the debt hawks have been claiming is coming at some point. I mean, if we end up at a point when where the United States needs to raise a lot of money fast and it can't just borrow it the way it usually does, uh, I think this is on the table. Um, and I, you know, it's quite plausible we will uh, get to that point. I mean, a lot of people were surprised that we were able to get the banking regulation we got with the 2010 Dodd Frank law, but that's because the banks blew up the global economy. Right. It's so hard, it's hard to say what might actually be the impetus for something like this. Yeah, but you know, Americans are fine in general with the idea of raising taxes on the wealthy. Yeah. There's a point at which they do worry. Uh, well, first it's the billionaires, then the millionaires, and then it's me. Right. And uh, everybody does like to imagine themselves as a millionaire someday. So you may not necessarily favor taxes on your future rich self. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, that if we have a crisis or recession, that stuff matters less. Absolutely. All right. Well, we want to thank everybody for listening to this Ballads and Dollars a podcast from Yahoo Finance. Be sure to follow us on Twitter. I'm at Alexis TV News. I'm at Rick J. Newman. All right, we'll be back next week with a brand new episode. But in the meantime, do be sure to go and rate and review this podcast wherever you get your podcasts.